Jamie will talk about the modeling of immune trajectories over time, correlates of protection and co-circulation of different variants, and the rollout of multiple vaccines within an agent-based model for SARS coronavirus 2 and COVID-19. She'll speak for around 40 to 45 minutes, and after which we'll have time for audience questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A box during the talk, and we'll try our best to get through them before the seminar closes at 3 p.m. UK time. Without further ado, let's begin the seminar. Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this forum to present our work on uh, the mechanistic modeling of SARS-CoV-2 immune memory, vaccines, and variants. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here to present this work. Of course, this is, I am presenting on behalf of a large team of research scientists, software developers at IDM and the Gates Foundation. So just wanna um, highlight the, the large group of people that have gone into making this work possible. So as we all know, um, our bodies do a pretty incredible job of generating immunologic memory that serves as the basis for durable protective immunity. Um, and that immune memory consists of memory B cells, neutralizing antibodies, memory CD4 and CD8 T cells, and they each serve a different function in our immune system. So neutralizing antibodies, which I'll refer to as NABs, bind to viral proteins and block infection. They act very quickly and they block infection. Whereas CD8 T cells target viruses and kill the cells associated with virus, moderating disease severity. They also tend to act more slowly and respond more slowly. And um, we know that SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccines induce quite a robust neutralizing antibody response and stimulate T cells. And that's really what works to prevent infection and moderate disease severity. However, we also know that from, from basically every pathogen, um, waning neutralizing antibodies may lead to a loss of sterilizing immune protection over time, and that the growth of the and the introduction of immunovating variants that partially escape neutralization from existing NABs really threatens our existing immunity, either from natural infection or from vaccines. There is a bit of an unclear impact of these variants on T cell reactivity. There's lots of evidence to suggest that even if um, immune evading variants are able to evade immunity from neutralized antibody, we're still able to generate that T cell response to moderate disease severity. So that's really positive news. Um, and overall, we think that our understanding of immune memory will have important implications for protective immunity against SARS-CoV-2 and recurrent COVID-19. So there are many unanswered questions around SARS-CoV-2 immune dynamics. There are kind of, I'm categorizing these as scientific questions, and policy questions. So among our scientific questions, we don't have a strong understanding yet of what level of antibody is protective against infection, symptomatic COVID-19 and severe disease. Um, this is what people refer to as a correlate of protection that would help us understand what the, the efficacy of a vaccine is given how strong of an antibody response it induces or how efficacious is natural infection in protecting against future risk of disease. Um, and additionally, how much do we expect that protection to wane over time? As I said, antibodies wane naturally in individuals. In fact, we want antibodies to wane, um, but we have immune memory that kicks in when we're faced with a new challenge. And so how much do we expect protection to wane over time against SARS-CoV-2 infection and disease? And then what role will immune memory play in the face of, of waning NAVs? In terms of the policy questions, these include how well do vaccines, how well will and do vaccines compete with and protect against immune evading variants, as we've seen from alpha to beta, gamma, now delta, and even considering other variants such as lambda um, as the virus evolves into the future. These variants have the ability to evade the existing immunity, and we're still testing and collecting data to understand how our current vaccines can protect against these immune evading variants. And then how much, does this, um, how much does this vary based on the timing and variant properties? And then another really important question that's being posed right now as we speak is whether we can fractionalize vaccines to increase global distribution without sacrificing vaccine efficacy. Um, so these are just some motivating questions to, um, to motivate why it's important to understand SARS-CoV-2 immune dynamics, include them in our models, and then questions that we might be able to answer with a model that captures immune memory. 
So let me just tackle, try to tackle, or at least talk about that first question. What level of antibody is protective against infection, symptomatic COVID-19, and severe disease? So one approach that we can get at to answering this is to take the now plethora of both vaccine trials, um, cohorts, data, data that has been provided from cohorts of observational data looking at individuals who either recovered from infection or were vaccinated and then following them over time to understand what their reduction in their risk of infection, symptomatic COVID and severe disease is. And so our group jointly estimated the relationship between neutralizing antibodies and the reduction in the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection, symptomatic COVID and severe disease. What we did was we took uh, data on the neutralizing antibody response following natural infection from many cohorts of, um, of reinfected patients, and as well as the safety and immunogenicity studies from vaccine efficacy, from vaccine trials. Um, and so for each of these studies, we have an average cohort neutralizing antibody level. Um, what we did was, and this is quite common in the literature right now, because the assays for neutralizing antibodies are quite disparate. Each study uses a different assay. And so we normalized the neutralizing antibody for each of these cohorts, each of these uh, cohorts relative to convalescent serum. So what that means is um, for, uh, if you see this data point up here, data point J, which is the Moderna, Moderna vaccine, you could see that they have around a five-fold higher they induce a five-fold higher neutralizing antibody response compared to a natural infection. And so for each of these trials, we've normalized the neutralizing antibody response and then extracted the relevant reduction in the risk of infection, symptomatic COVID and severe disease, and then jointly estimated. And you can see that there's quite a strong relationship between neutralizing antibodies and reduction in infection um, and disease. As, as we increase neutralizing antibody response, we also have a uh, increased risk, reduced risk of infection and disease. What we can infer from this though, is that conditional on a breakthrough infection, protection against symptomatic and severe disease is uncorrelated with neutralizing antibodies. If you go back here, you see there's quite a strong relationship for all three of these marginal efficacies, but the shape of these curves is not necessarily that different. And what we see is that conditional on having a breakthrough infection. So for somebody who had a prior infection and then gets a secondary infection or somebody who had vaccine and then gets infected, there is an, um, the risk of progressing to symptomatic and severe disease seems to be uncorrelated with NABs. That's what this flat line indicates. And what we think this suggests is that there's some other immune mechanism probably memory T cells, which can be stimulated to provide protection even when antibodies have either waned or are insufficient to fight off infection. So this is quite an interesting finding. And then we can ask how much will protection wane over time and what role will immune memory play in the face of waning NABs? So what we did here was that we fit a model of waning immunity to cohorts of previously infected patients. So this panel here on the left shows a large amount of data from several different cohorts um, from Ireland and the U, um, from, sorry, yeah, from, from the UK, um, looking at antibody kinetics over time in cohorts of patients who were previously, who, who recovered from SARS-CoV-2, they were either hospitalized and then they're followed over time to test their antibody um, measurements. And then on the right-hand side, you can see we fit a two-part exponential decay to these cohorts of patients to show how much immune memory wanes over time. And then what we've done is we've projected onto these waning immunities um, different levels of neutralizing antibodies. So this blue line, for example, represents an individual who might have received uh, Pfizer two-dose vaccination. And so their immune memory um, boosts after those two doses up to this peak and then it decays according to this two-part exponential decay. And similarly, somebody who, who recovered from a natural infection might have a lower, res lower immune response, but it still boosts and then decays. Somebody who received the AstraZeneca vaccine would have an even lower um, immune response that then decays, and then even lower for individuals who only receive one dose of either Pfizer or AstraZeneca. And the question is, 
how do these levels, using what we've inferred from the relationship between neutralizing antibodies and protective efficacy, how can we map these onto a reduction in efficacy over time? And so then we're able to use these models to estimate protection over time. Um, and so for each of those trajectories that I showed in the previous slide, here I'm plotting in days since that immunity event, whether it's natural infection or vaccination, how much efficacy against infection, against symptomatic COVID and against severe disease declines. And then I'm also here mapping on um, infection challenge with both the wild type and the Delta vaccine, and, and the Delta variant, excuse me. And what we can see is that protection against Delta infection is under 50% for individuals who only received one dose of the Pfizer vaccine, as well as both one and two doses of AstraZeneca. You can see that's all of these lines down here, that, that they are less than 50% likely um, to be protected by their prior immunity from, from those vaccines. However, these individuals retain quite strong protection against severe disease given any immunity level. So this really underscores the role of T cells and what I described before as that conditional protection. So conditional on having any neutralizing antibodies, we expect our immune, immune memory to kick in and protect against symptomatic and more importantly, severe disease. And that's why we're seeing again and again that while there may be breakthrough infections, we think that even with the Delta variant, which reduces our neutralization of our existing antibodies, we're seeing very little severe disease among people who are vaccinated against with really any vaccine. And so this is really positive news. Um, so the goal here was now we've done this estimation, we've tried to understand the relationship between neutralizing antibodies and protective efficacy, how that changes over time. And then we can integrate this information into our models of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 disease progression to be able to explore and play out different scenarios around vaccination, non-pharmaceutical interventions, and emerging variants of concern. So COVASIM is our group's agent-based model of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. It contains detailed intra-host dynamics such as age-varying susceptibility and time-varying viral load. Uh, we're modeling synthetic contact networks. So you can see in this top right, we have contacts between individuals within households, schools, workplaces, and really the, the model is quite user-friendly and you're able to add um, any synthetic contact network. So we've added um, long-term care facilities and in different settings, different types of networks. And then we're able to model different interventions such as um, test, trace, and quarantine. We've used this to evaluate school closure and school reopening, uh, testing within school, symptomatic screening, and of course, um, in the last uh, half a year, uh, vaccination has been uh, the primary um, use case for, for this type of modeling. And what we've added into this model, um, based on what I just previously described, is immune trajectories over time, correlates of protection, so relating that immunity to some reduction in the risk of disease and infection, the waning of immunity and the loss of protection against infection, which would lead to reinfection, and of course, multiple circulating variants and multiple vaccines with different properties. And so COVASIM now tracks the level of neutralizing in antibodies in individuals over time. And so following either uh, infection or vaccination, an individual would draw an initial neutralizing antibody level from a log normal distribution that's based on the source. So uh, we know that natural infection induces quite a strong response um, in terms of neutralizing antibodies, but some of the vaccines induce an even higher response, as I showed previously. And that level is moderated by prior symptoms for natural infection. What we see is that individuals who had a more asymptomatic or severe disease actually induce a stronger antibody response than an asymptomatic infection. And so we're capturing that individual level heterogeneity. And then either vaccines or infection can prime meaning that it generates the first neutralizing antibody response in an individual or boost that NAB level. So if an individual, for example, was infected with wild type infection early in, in the epidemic and they have an antibody response that then begins to wane and then they receive the Pfizer vaccine, that antibody response would be boosted even higher. And that's what we're seeing in, in the studies and the data is that 
um, vaccination following natural infection is even stronger than just vaccination on its own. You really um, in, induce a very strong neutralizing antibody level. And so our model is keeping track of the most recent NAB conferring event. Um, we do this um, in order to account for how effective those NABs are against um, a challenge by, a, by an infection. And so I'll describe that in more detail. However, there's an important simplifying assumption that we're making here, which is that we're not recording the entire history of immune inducing events. Um, part of this is we don't have enough data to understand how a combination of different immune events over time shapes an individual's immune trajectory going forward. And so we've built enough flexibility to be able to adapt as new information um, becomes available and the science changes. But for now, we are making a simplifying assumption that we only care about the most recent immune inducing event or NAB conferring event. And I'll describe that in a little bit more detail. So as I said, we're modeling these different variants that are circulating. So we're modeling the phenotypic differences of variants, including relative transmissibility, relative severity, and then importantly, partial immune escape. Um, so here's just a table that, that describes some uh, default parameters that are in the model for four different variants of concern. These are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. You might be more familiar with B117, B1351, P1, and B1617. The nomenclature has been changing a lot. So what we're doing is we're modeling these variants and allowing them to have a different amount of transmissibility. And this is quantified as relative to wild type infections. So we can see that alpha is uh, 1.67 times more transmissible. So per contact, there's a higher chance of transmission if you're exposed to alpha relative to wild type. Similarly, it's a more severe infection. Uh, um, it's a variant that contains more severe disease. So you're more likely to progress to severe disease. And then we're capturing relative immunity. And what I mean here is this, um, this refers to the reduction in neutralizing antibody titers for somebody with a history of wild type infection or for a given vaccine source. So for example, if somebody was exposed to, um, or somebody recovered from infection with the beta variant, um, which we know is not necessarily more transmissible, but it does seem to be more severe and severely evade immunity. Um, and that's why it seems to have really taken hold in South Africa. And this uh, is the variant that was originally discovered in South Africa. So if that individual was then exposed to, um, sorry, if, if in, sorry, let me just back up for a second. So let's say that we have the beta variant, which as I said, is, is not more transmissible, but more severe and evades immunity. And we have an individual who had a prior infection with the regular wild type virus, and then they're exposed to beta. So we know that with wild type, with natural infection, we induce this antibody response and we hope or expect that it's protective against future infection. But the problem is these immunovating variants, they really reduce the neutralization that an individual already has. So what we would do here is that for that individual, we would reduce their NAB level 15 fold and then map back to that original neutralizing antibody to efficacy map. And you would see that that individual would be severely at risk for infection, that their wild type infection wouldn't protect them against an infection with beta variants. Um, similarly, even Pfizer and Moderna might not provide very strong protection against infection with beta. However, as we've seen, um, even if individuals have breakthrough infections, we think that the, our immune memory does kick in to provide protection against severe disease, symptomatic and severe disease. And so what we can do with this type of model is ask questions around how well variants would compete in different epidemiological contexts. So here I'm going to just describe a case study, uh, which is one use case for this type of modeling. Um, and so what we're looking at is we're gonna compare three different settings, characterizing them as near zero transmission, controlled transmission, or widespread transmission. And so you might think about this as in the near zero transmission, this might be a regime where there was strict and stringent lockdown measures that were enforced wherever community transmission was detected, that these settings would have an R effective of under one. And examples might be Australia, New Zealand, and 
uh, Vietnam, where the proportion of the population with some immunity from prior infection is close to zero because there really hasn't been widespread transmission. In contrast, our controlled transmission setting would be a setting where there has been moderately tolerated transmission, um, stricter measures enforced when transmission exceeds some tolerable threshold, where our effective is about one, um, and there's moderate, a moderate share of the population has some immunity from prior infection. This could be, for example, the United Kingdom or Germany. And for now, all of these are prior to any vaccination. And then a setting, the regime of widespread transmission might be um, a framework where there was limited ability or desire to enforce strict law measures for multiple different reasons. And that, that resulted in widespread transmission. So this would be a situation where the reproductive, effective reproductive number was well over one. You might think of a Brazil or a Kenya and in India. Um, and in these settings, the proportion of the population with some immunity from prior infection would be quite high. So what we're doing now is we wanna see how well do different variants compete in these different epidemiological contexts where there's a different share of the population has some immunity from a prior infection. And so what we've simulated is these three settings um, and then introduced both B1351 and B117, that's the alpha and beta variant. And you may recall that B1351 does a great job of escaping prior immunity, whereas B117 does not do a great job escaping prior immunity, but it's much more transmissible. And what we see is that um, in settings with moderate to high immunity, B1351 outcompetes B117, but it is outcompeted in settings with low immunity. So let me just orient you to what we're, what we're looking at here. On the left-hand side, this panel is showing for these three um, regimes that I described, what is the distribution of neutralizing antibodies in the population? So you could see for the near zero tra transmission regime, this blue, uh, blue line, the large share of the population has very, very low neutralizing antibodies, indicating that they haven't had a lot of prior infection or they don't have existing population immunity. Um, that moderate transmission, the, the, the um, distribution is shifted slightly to the right. And then in the high transmission, the distribution is much more heavily um, in the middle of this neutralizing antibody uh, spectrum, indicating that there's a lot of prior immunity in that population from devastating first and second waves, for example. And so now if we compare new infections by variant, where the B117 is this dark pink and the B1351 is the lighter pink, you could see that if there's near zero transmission, very little population level immunity, B117 strongly outcompetes B1351 because that variant doesn't have to have the property of evading immunity and its ability to replicate more quickly and transmit more actually gives it a strong advantage. And then as you go down towards moderate transmission and widespread transmission, where there's more population immunity, and we can think now this might even be a setting where there's a high vaccination a variant that is able to escape immunity will start to outcompete a variant that's unable to escape immunity but has a fitness advantage with respect to transmissibility. And then interestingly, on the right-hand side, we're, we're mapping severe cases by variant um, in the 60 days following the importation of that variant. And this kind of relates to what I was describing earlier where our prior immunity may not protect us against infection but it provides strong protection against symptomatic and severe disease. So on the left-hand panel here, of, of, and on the left bar of the near zero transmission, we can see that there are a large number of severe cases of uh, COVID-19 following the introduction of these variants. And that's largely due to the fact that there is no prior immunity in these populations. We're also not necessarily simulating control measures like non-pharmaceutical interventions. This is really just a vanilla simulation and comparing these three scenarios. And as we increase the, the regimes and the amount of immunity in the population, we still get, we still get um, new infections, but the number of severe cases significantly decreases, indicating that while we might have secondary infections uh, caused by these variants, 
those will, will be less likely to progress to severe disease, which is fantastic. And of course, we expect that vaccines will do even better against these variants than uh, natural infection and natural immunity alone. So now we wanna um, try to understand how do these immune escape variants affect critical vaccine thresholds? Um, so I'm just gonna take that middle of the middle of those three regimes. So now we have a setting of controlled transmission where there's some moderate amount of prior immunity in the population. Our effective is about one. Um, here we're considering a situation where about 40% of the population has some immunity from a prior wild type infection. So you might think of a setting where there was a strong first wave um, where about 40% of the population had been infected. Many, of course, may not have shown any symptoms of disease, but they have some immunity to uh, from that infection um, after 10 months of the epidemic. And then we want to look at what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated? Here we're considering AstraZeneca, which is being used um, in lots of the lots of low and middle income countries and lots of Europe, in fact, to be able. So, what percentage of the population needs to be infected in order to be able to lift NPI restrictions? Sorry, there's a typo here. Depending upon whether B1351 is circulating. So let's let me just clarify this a little bit. Basically, we're saying. Um, we want to be able to reduce lockdown measures to lift NPI restrictions. Um, but how does the uh, circulation of an immunivating variant um, impact how much vaccination coverage needs to um, be accomplished in order to lift those NPI restrictions without causing um, more transmission and a, and a potential resurgence of infection? And so what we see here is that B1351 considerably increases the critical vaccine threshold that's needed to be able to lift NPIs without resulting in a resurgence of infections. So I'm plotting in these four panels, comparing the baseline where we do not have B1351 to a scenario where B1351 is introduced, and then plotting infections, symptomatic cases, severe cases, and are effective, which is that indication of whether there might be a resurgence coming in, in the future. And then on the x-axis, increasing along the x-axis is the share of adults that are vaccinated with AstraZeneca. So you can see, let's, let's start with this top left panel, panel A, that if an in the population is vaccinated with 0%, then we would see a huge increase in infections following the introduction of B1351. As we saw before, that's because we have this setting of moderate transmission where um, even though a share of the population would have immunity, B1351 B1, would do a pretty good job of evading that immunity. And if you look at the scales, you can see um, about half of those infections might, less than half of those infections might go on to symptomatic disease, but then a very small share of them would go on to severe disease. Um, but in this setting, this would lead to an R effective of almost two. So this would be really lead to a huge resurgence of infection. And as we increase in the percentage of adults vaccinated, we both decrease the number of infections over the 60 days, the number of symptomatic and severe cases, and of course, the R effective. But the thing that's important to note is that um, B1351 changes the level of vaccine that's required to reach sufficiently low um, numbers of infections, symptomatic severe diseases. And then we're gonna capture that in this R effective. So we really want an R effective that's below one. And so with, in the absence of B1351, we might achieve that with around 60% of, of adults vaccinated. But uh, you could see that with 60% of adults vaccinated, if B1351 is introduced, we're still looking at an R effective of about 1.5. And so we really need to push out to a larger share of the population or potentially vaccinate with a vaccine like Pfizer um, or Moderna that might do better against B1351 than AstraZeneca seems to do against B1351. And so what we think we can learn from, from this immune, uh, immune memory dynamics is that as more time passes, um, populations are accruing immunity from many different sources, from prior waves of infection, from different vaccines that are being introduced. 
And so we think that capturing these immune dynamics in our models is becoming even more and more essential to be able to make accurate predictions, to be able to compare vaccine strategies moving forward. And additionally, as neutral, even as neutralizing antibodies wane, we expect long-term immune memory to provide some protection against severe disease. So this is promising as, especially as we have more vaccination that's waning over time and the introduction of immune evading variants, I think we have we can be somewhat confident that in the presence of some immunity from, from vaccination or from natural infection, we will be able to provide protection against severe disease. But of course, what we know and what we see is that vaccination is critical for protecting populations and that the exact amount of vaccination requires, uh, depends on characteristics of the evolving virus. Um, and so this kind of brings up a topic that's really interesting for us and that we're starting to think about, which is the fractionalization of, of um, vaccine doses. Of course, there's a hugely inequitable distribution of vaccines globally. Um, the United States and, and really high income countries are doing exceptionally well with vaccine delivery and coverage, whereas large swaths of LMIC settings are struggling with vaccine rollout and supply. And we think that potentially expanding the, the vaccine by fractionalizing doses might be an opportunity to expand the global vaccine supply. But the exact amount of that depends on um, both the, the characteristics of, our, of this evolving virus. As, as variants become increasingly immunovating, how much can we get away fractionalizing um, vaccines? And in order to be able to answer that question, you really need a model that has these immune dynamics. And so with that, I will open up for questions and, and discussion. Thank you so much, Judy, for the brilliant overview of the potential of vaccine impact. We now have some time for audience questions. I see some of you are starting to post them on the Q&A uh, box, and we'll try our best to get through them before the seminar closes. You can also vote for questions that you would like us to address earlier. So I would, I would encourage you to do that if you see a question that you would like to ask being asked by someone else. But I would like to start the ball rolling with a question from my co-host, Rosie. And she asks if there is a ceiling or a limit to the levels of uh, NEBs in the model. You mentioned that it can be boosted if someone has a prior infection and then vaccination. So yeah, perhaps, that's, a, that's a great yeah. That's a great question. We do not impose a ceiling. Um, of course, let me see if I could go back. If I could go back to what we've inferred from. So yeah, we, we don't, we do not have a ceiling in the model. Um, and as you say, people can over time, people will, oh, you know, it's eventually this might look similar to either other coronaviruses or the flu, where over your lifetime you get. Um, exposed to infection or you get vaccines and boosters and your immunity just keeps boosting and boosting. And what we would see is, and, and you could see it here, is that there's kind of an asymptote um, to the, re the risk reduction at very high neutralizing antibody levels. So it's, we don't think that um, once you have a sufficiently high NAB response, you're not going to get much better um, reduction in the risk of infection or severe disease from you know, a mar marginal increase in that level. So the model certainly doesn't impose any kind of upper limit on, on neutralizing antibodies. So if somebody gets um, you know, a lot of shots, in, a lot of vaccine shots in the model, they'll, they'll have very high neutralizing antibodies, but we don't think that that individual would have a significantly greater advantage than somebody who just got two doses and you know, that was that. Yeah, I think it's also quite unethical to get many, many, yes. many doses of the vaccine right. given that you know, there's a supply constraint. Of so course. we don't recommend that in any way. No, we don't. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for that. Um, we have a next question from another audience member, Anonymous. Um, what is the? Re I think it's more of a clarifying question. So what is the relationship between the capacity of the immune system to clear the virus, uh, on the other hand, and the risk of immune response uh, will it self cause damaging inflammation or autoimmunity on the other? Mm -hmm. So I, I am not, I'm neither a virologist, immunologist, or biologist. So I don't have, or medical doctor by training. So I don't want to assume, um, I, I don't want to try to answer something that I, that I don't know the answer to, but however, I will say that, um, I think I may have mentioned earlier in the slides that of course we know that neutralizing antibodies wane 
And then that waning is actually protective. We don't want individuals to be sitting around with really high level of neutralizing antibody. And so I think that kind of speaks to the point that there is this trade-off between these high level of NAVs, which can clear infection and fight off infection, and then the, the individual level outcomes that might be associated with high neutralizing antibodies. And that's particularly why the role of T cells, I think, is so important that we might not over time, our, our neutralizing antibodies may wane such that we can't actually quickly enough fight off infection, but we'll have that, you know, we'll have a, um, an, our T cell response will be stimulated and we will have no problem fighting off symptomatic or severe disease. Uh, but sorry, I'm unable to, to really go into the detail yeah. there because I just am not familiar. No worries. Um, Antonio asks if you're aware of any other research done into COVID co-infections with two or more um, SARS coronavirus 2 variants and what are the implications uh, for long-term immunity in that situation? Yeah. yeah, so that's a great question. We we are currently assuming that there is no super infection in the model, so individuals can only be infected with one variant at a time. Um, and so we're not in the model currently exploring that. And I'm I'm quite unfamiliar with the literature on that. I would think it, it's probably exceedingly rare, but um, I, I unfamiliar and we are assuming that um, that you can't be infected simultaneously with multiple variants. You can be infected within your lifetime by multiple variants, but not, not simultaneously. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's probably rare and also we're not familiar with the literature around it. Um, Actually, let me just add one additional point there, which is that uh, we do, of course, capture the effect that each of these variants has on an individual. So while you can't simultaneously have to be infected with two variants in our model, if you you would still get the the uh, immune response from each of those uh, um, events being infected with each of those. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, Mihai has a question. Um, B one three five one has now been largely outcompeted by the gamma variant in South Africa, where um, B one three five one was dominant before. Is this consistent with the results of the model? Yeah, so I think it's being largely outcompeted by the Delta variant, um, B1617, um, although you could correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a really great, so one of the use cases of this model is to be able to see how different variants compete. And so in these slides, I looked at B117 and B1351, um, and, and then the question becomes, well, how would these increasingly immunivating variants or variants with different, um, different characteristics compete against each other. Um, I think I have in here what we're assuming for um, beta versus delta. So here you could see that beta does a much better job of evading immunity than both gamma and delta. So I, I suppose in this scenario, it doesn't really matter which one it is, but gamma and delta do a much better job of replicating, of actually transmitting. So per contact, they're more likely to transmit. And so there's a competition there between these two, these two variants where probably in a setting with extremely high population immunity, you know, really a population that's either vaccinated or has, um, has been overtaken by multiple waves of infection, you, you might expect beta to outcompete gamma and delta. But, um, you know, in a setting like South Africa, where we have unfortunately haven't seen a lot of vaccination there, I think it's hovering around three to 5% of the population being vaccinated now. So while there is natural infection, histories of natural infection, I would expect gamma and delta to begin to outcompete beta because they are more transmissible um, and still are able to evade immunity, just not to the same degree as beta. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that as well. Uh, Sam Abbott would like to first commend you on a great talk. He then goes on to ask, have you compared your simulation on slide 14, very specific, um, variant dynamics in different transmission immunity scenarios to real world data? Do you see the dynamics expected uh, by the model? And following on that, um, do you find that modeling this dynamics improves forecast performance in general or in certain settings? That's a great question. So I don't have, I think we can think of use cases where, um, not, not necessarily this exact um, scenario, although South Africa is a perfect example where B, B1351 has outcompeted the alpha variant. Um, and we would, and, and you could use the model to try to postulate why that was the case, where B117 really took off in, in large parts of Europe 
and really all over the world, but in South Africa in particular and other settings, um, B1351 outcompeted the alpha variant. And we would use this model to infer that that's because there was maybe a larger first wave or more widespread population immunity that B1351 had the competitive advantage against B117 of being able to evade that existing immunity. Um, and we certainly can um, use the model to try to um, see how well it performs against existing data and where we are doing that. Um, we are not, our, our group is not necessarily in the business of doing forecasting. Really, we try to use the model to evaluate and compare different um, strategies and compare them relative to each other. So for example, looking at different vaccine um, coverage strategies or non-pharmaceutical interventions in the face of, of vaccination. I certainly do think that in order to be able to do good for forecasting, you do need to have an understanding of, especially as time has gone on and people are accruing these immune events that um, moderate their risk of infection moving forward and their risk of severe disease, that it's really probably becoming increasingly challenging to do real forecasting without the ability to capture um, the different characteristics of variants, the immune history of individuals and populations. Um, and while maybe our forecasts might, we might be able to make good forecasts, it might be because we're making some other assumption that's kind of uh, covering up uh, not having that immunity, uh, immune dynamics in the model. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, so um, I'm going to probably combine these two questions because I think they're going to be along the same lines and you can probably just take both of them together. Um, Michael and Sophia Wolf asked if, you know, the effective R increased even when percentage of adults vaccinated uh, from 60 to 80% um, despite the absence of the variant and what could be the possible cause of this. Um, and then continuation from that. So I think this is your graph in scenario two where the effective R not value for B1, but yeah, that's the plot there. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think this is likely to become an issue in real life settings where vaccines are effectively unable to interrupt transmission? What are the implications um, around you know, reopening and removing control measures and relaxing um, restrictions like mask wearing or like you know, not allowing people to go into the office and whatnot? Sure, yeah, so um, just to tackle that first question, I think if I had confidence intervals here, you would see that these two scenarios overlap. And so I think that is just, um, I don't think these two are statistically significantly different. Um, and so I wouldn't, wouldn't really worry too much about that. It's more kind of the trend that you're seeing. Um, with respect to, yeah, it looks like we're not really reaching, even with 100% vaccination, we're not really reaching that threshold of being under one. Um, I think there are a few things going on here. One is that, yes, maybe we do in the face of increasingly immunivating variants, we will need vaccines that are better and better able to, um, to fight off these immunivating variants. However, um, there is a distinction between infection and then symptomatic severe disease and of hospitalization and of course death. Uh, we don't want circulation of infection because, um, you know, that it, means that there will be ongoing circulation that could lead to the evolution of new virus, new variants of concern. Um, and there will be pressure on that, on that virus to con continually evolve to ev evade immunity. However, asymptomatic infection isn't our primary concern. Really our concern is, is severe and disease and, and death, right? So uh, we might be, be willing to withstand an R effective of around one if it means that less than, you know, in 60 days in this population, maybe 30 people are getting severe cases. And so I think there's a trade-off here that's less obvious. You know, I tried to, sorry, um, try to show with each of these panels that while there still will be infections, um, the number of symptomatic and severe cases should be quite low even, um, even in these, these settings. So um, that's something that I think our use of our effective as the most important measure will probably change over time and it's already changed over time. And really what we kind of just underscore is that what we care most about is severe, severe disease. Exactly. And I think it also probably, you know, is answering this question by an anonymous attendee. Um, are you considering at some point in time to actually add long COVID uh, into your models? Mm -hmm. um, great. Yes, that's, that's a really great, that's a great point. Um, and it's something that we don't currently have in the models. Uh, again, for um, a lot of data reasons, on the one hand, we, yeah. you know, we, we are uh, 
increase, the model was built to be very flexible, to be able to adapt as our understanding of, of the science changes and, and grows over time. And for that's the exact reason why we recently added in these immune dynamics, because we now have sufficient information to be able to appropriately characterize it and model it. I think long COVID will probably be one of the next things that we really start to try to capture because um, while it's not severe, um, while it is distinct from severe uh, cases and, and deaths, it's still, of course, we know will impact uh, morbidity and, and should be a strong consideration. And that yeah. is a, that's a great point. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we have um, Cecile Vibot would like to first comment you on a really good talk, a fabulous talk actually she says, and she would like to ask now, um, she, we have seen a lot of heterogeneity in the dynamics of variant invasion in middle ground scenarios you described of semi-controlled transmissibility Europe-US. For instance, we see very clearly sweeps of alpha and delta to 100% dominance in the UK versus more strain diversity in the US, even at uh, the local levels where no variant reaches above 80%. Is your model actually able to reproduce this diversity? Yeah, that, that's a great question. We haven't, um, we haven't quite tested um, its ability to reproduce that, but it's a, it is a great like validation technique to say in this setting, given the history uh, that we've seen in terms of multiple waves, different um, share of the population in age distributions of vaccination, can we reproduce the strain competition that we're seeing in these settings? We haven't yet used the model to test that, but it would be a great way to validate the parameters that we're using in the model and, and to be able to try to reproduce it. It's a great suggestion. Um, there's a question from Amy, Amy Thomas. Have you considered how different ages within a population like the UK, for example, will reach different vaccines, I think, with different vaccines, AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine, and what is the impact this might have on the emergence of variants of concerns given the differences in contact patterns by age? Yeah, certainly. It's a great point. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, the reasons why we added in this functionality is because um, the different vaccines are, because there's been such a heterogeneous rollout of these vaccines, especially in in LMIC settings, even in, in the UK, as is described in this question, in this question uh, different vaccines are being targeted to different populations and therefore their, their relative efficacy might really matter. So for example, AstraZeneca doesn't seem to induce as strong of a neutralizing antibody response. It probably would lead to more breakthrough infections um, if challenged by an increasingly immunovating variant. But if that vaccine is targeted to the young population um, if that might not, we might not be as worried about it for multiple reasons because their relative susceptibility is lower in relative transmission. However, there might be differences in contact patterns. So it's really dynamic. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are going on here that are at play. Um, I think that's another great use case for the model. We haven't necessarily already done that, but um, racking up ideas here. Um, thanks for that clarification. So we now have probably the last question from the audience, and I think it's more of a clarifying question. Um, do you also model inactivated vaccine-induced immunity and protein subunit vaccine-induced immunity? And do you expect there to be any differences? Yeah, so we are not, answer? yeah, no, 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 it's a, it's a great question. Um, we are not modeling, I should also note here that we are not modeling, for example, T cells. All we're modeling with respect to immunity um, and but within both the vaccines and natural infection is the induction of neutralizing antibodies that have some relationship to infection reduction, severe uh, symptomatic and, and severe disease reduction. So we're not modeling differences in vaccines that are the mRNA versus the protein and activated vaccines, except for the differences that might exist between these vaccines and their ability to induce antibodies. However, as I've said now several times, Really, um, we made these assumptions based on, and these choices based on the, the current state of the literature, our current understanding with the, with the knowledge and the intention of being flexible. And so as more information about potential differences with respect to these different classes of vaccines and the way they induce immunity, it's possible that these other vaccines induce a stronger T cell response. And so therefore we're, we will need to capture that to accurately depict what's happening in, in reality. So. We're not currently doing that, but um, it's, it's a great point. And I think it underscores that this is meant to be quite flexible moving forward as our understanding of the space evolves. Thank you this so is the much. Same. Yeah, sorry. No, no, go on, go on. 
I was going to say it's the same thing with respect to waning immunity. Like we, we have made assumptions about um, how immunity wanes based on around, you know, 12 months of data. But as we accrue more data, that will also be refined as we as our understanding of, of immune profiles changes. And I think that given the fact that there are so many different vaccines currently in the pipeline, we will probably also need to update models and things like that. Yeah, I agree with that. Certainly. So Elizabeth, we'd like to thank you for the superb presentation and so will I. Thank you, Jamie, for being so patient with us and really going through so many audience questions. We really, you know, we're very privileged to have you speak at our seminar this month. And I would like to thank the audience for also taking the time to join us this Thursday afternoon in the UK um, for the seminar. The sun is out right now, and I hope you're at least able to catch some good sunlight in the UK. Take, thank you take so much. Care. It was my, my pleasure. Take care.